This conference will now be recorded. Well, hello, friends. Welcome to ABS Stamp Chat. I am Heidi. It's so nice to see everybody on the call today. I can't wait for us to jump in. Uh, today is a great opportunity for some good old-fashioned armchair travel, which, considering the news around the world, I think a little bit of escapism is probably in order. And uh, I hope that we can all feel a little bit more refreshed. Undeniably, we will learn something new and that clicks us all sort of uh, brain neurons and serotonin. So we'll leave it at that. Friends, we know how stamps soothe. I mean, heck, the Wall Street Journal blew up this weekend with that great article. Uh, I saw my father sent it. It was uh, reprinted in the Seattle Times. So we know what a great hobby this is. And I'm sure that you're getting more and more people asking you about it, considering how popular it's become. So I'd like you to help us with our recruitment efforts, friends. Uh, join the APS. It's a great place. If you've got any friends who are like, oh, yeah, I think that's pretty cool, you know, have them go to stamps.org. It's a wonderful place for people to get their foundational, uh, you know, to get their legs wet and get that foundational knowledge, as well as to build to, you know, whether it's topicals or high philately or et cetera, et cetera. There's something for everybody. And we know that. That's why we're in the hobby. And again, I want to thank our APS members to include our speaker, Dr. Morrill, um, for making this happen. Remember, it's your membership. It's your, it's your donations. It's your support, it's your reposting. That's what makes the APS so strong. Let's go for 134 more years of membership in the APS and let's all get on the wave in the renaissance of stamp collecting. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Richard Morrill. He has been on Stamp Chat before and he also comes on quite frequently to listen and learn because that's what we do as philatelists. Uh, he comes to us from London. He is the curator for the philatelic studies of the British Library. So we're very happy for him to come here and he is going to be presenting on From Concept to Reality Tanganyika's 1961 independence issue stamps. And this is really fun because he's going to take us for fun, learned, insert your, your adverb. Uh, he's gonna take us from the beginning to the end and what it takes for a stamp to, uh, to end up on a cover on your envelope. So without further ado, Dr. Richard Morrill, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we'll take questions at the end. Feel free to use the chat box if you wanna talk. That'll be your, I'll be talking, calling your name. If you'd rather me uh, read your read your question or your inquiry, just put it into a private message to me. Thanks so much. Thanks, Richard. No, thanks for having me back and thank you to the APS for, for inviting me here and everyone who's listening. Um, today, I thought I'd do something a bit different to the stuff I was been talking about previously. Um, uh, during the, the 1960s, numerous colonial territories obtained independence from British rule. And after independence, many employed the Crown agents uh, to manage the production of their postage stamps. Now, this organisation commissioned one designer known as Victor Whiteley to design numerous independence stamps uh, during his lifetime. So uh, th this designer designed the independence stamps of British Guyana, Jamaica, Barbados, Kenya, Tanganyika, Uganda, um, and also the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen, in addition to a range of other um, definitive issues, commemorative issues. So, so he, he's actually a very historically significant design, but one who's also um, deeply understudied, unlike his, his contemporaries, David Gentleman and Jennifer Toombs. Um, and this article, or, or this, this presentation, I should say, is going to look at his work in developing Tanganyika's 9th of December 1961 independence issue. Now, stamps are an inherent part of our visual material and historical culture. They have a context, they're created for a reason. Uh, and I'd just very likely uh, like to begin with kind of the background and context to what led to the creation of these stamps. So let's start with the, with the obvious, um, uh, where is Tanganyika? Um, so 
it's a region situated on the East African coastline. I'm just going to move my arrow across to roughly where it is here. Um, and it initially became a German colony in the kind of 1880s. Uh, and then during the, the uh, First World War, the British become increasingly influential in the region. And by a League of, Man uh, League of Nations mandate in 1922, the territory was formally transferred to the colonial administration of the British. And desire for independence from colonial rule was always present in the region, uh, but gained ever increasing momentum following the Second World War. Um, today, of course, the country is known as Tanzania uh, because it, it, it merged with the territories of Zanzibar. But, you know, you can see it there. It gives you an idea of, of where we're at. So by March 1961, the Secretary of State for the Colonies, Sir Ian Norman MacLeod, um, he participated in a constitutional conference held in the Tanganyika capital, Dar es Salaam, uh, and it closed on the 31st of March 1961, with the delegates all announcing uh, that the East African colony would be self-governing -gov by the 1st of May prior to obtaining full independence around December 1961. And um, after, after May's election, um, the new prime minister, Julius Kambaraj Nyeri, commissioned a set of 12 new postage stamps scheduled for release on Independence Day. Um, the design theme that Nyeri selected was tailored to meet his vision of Tan Tanganyika's economic and social development. Inheriting kind of governance over one of the, then one of the world's most poorest nations, this is actually quite an astute move on his part. Most people didn't have access to a television or radio, and that kind of rendered methods of political canvassing ineffectual. And likewise, with the population being predominantly rural and widely dispersed, um, billboard and poster campaigns were also impractical. Despite limited literacy, Individuals would have encountered stamps in a range of contexts, making them an excellent medium for promoting Nieri's political manifesto. So he, he, he instructs Tanganyika's controller of information services to compile research material for the stamp designer. And this comprised over 70 photographs, several postcards and, and possibly some audio material. Um, and then this material was sent across to the Crown agents. And this is a picture here of their, of their headquarters at the time in, in uh, London, uh, 45 Millbank. Um, and they, they were uh, set up in the 19th century, essentially to act as middlemen on behalf of the colonial office and, and the colonial territories. So if you needed uh, rail, you know, trains or rail, railroad, or you needed bank boots or coins or stamps, you would put your orders in with this organization who would contact the relevant security um, printers and oversee the in in for philatelists the oversee the production of the stamps and uh they then forwarded in the, the material to uh victor whiteley's studio by mid-may 1961 and armed with the necessary material victor whiteley depicted here spent the next two months preparing a range of potential designs in his studio situated in 48 Chandos Place, London, WC1. Um, interestingly, in my last talk on, on embossed revenue stamps, you may recall um, Thomas Major, well, he was also active in this area a couple of centuries before, and the, the building in question, he was up on the top floor here. Now, bearing in mind that he was designing so many important stamps and independence issue stamps, it's a pity there's no blue plaque there to kind of commemorate the site's um, kind of historic significance, but it still stands. Um, so turning now to, you know, during those two months when he's producing those designs, what did he produce? I think, you know, we'll, we'll have a look now at some of this material. So Nieri was a, a teacher and writer on, on educational reform, uh, and it was education was central to Nieri's vision for national economic and social development. Consequently, the five cent stamp being kind of the lowest and most commonly encountered denomination was selected to represent the theme of education. And Victor Whiteley submitted two different designs for the five cent stamp. The first one um, here, which was actually rejected, 
depicts a, a group of boys, um, which you can see here on this, what, what they call colour roughs, um, being taught chemistry in the Bwiru Government Secondary School. And this was submitted for consideration as a, as a five cent stamp on, on the 25th of May, 1961. So it gives you a good idea of how, how quick he's working. Um, and it was submitted for the five cent stamp, but um, eventually, as you can see, when we move on from the, the color rough to the, the color finish, where there's no denomination, and then the, the photographic bromide, it was eventually approved for the 20 um, cent denomination instead. And it was finally rejected on the 29th of June 1961. Um, and I, I think that Nieri's writings provide uh, quite an interesting explanation as to why this would have been the case. Uh, he wrote a very famous essay called Education for Self-Reliance. And in that text, written you know, shortly after this period, um, he heavily criticizes Tanganyika's secondary um, school education system as being too Western and out of touch with the daily needs and, and reality of Tanganyika's people. Um, and and I, I think that's why this was rejected. The second design, which we'll see in a minute, depicts a teacher instructing villagers, both young and old within a village, to kind of symbolize the nation's desire to raise their educational standards uh, for all their people. And, and this correlates much more closely to Nieri's views on education, or his published views on education anyway. Um, but the design was only uh, accepted following several modifications. And, and the design itself was actually inspired by this actual photograph here that was supplied to Whiteley um, by, you know, by, by the uh, Tanganyikan government. And it depicts um, a male teacher kind of seated opposite, uh, seated outdoors in a village surrounded by students of various ages looking intently while he gestures towards a, a large um, writing pad at the front of the, of the class. Now Whiteley's initial pencil sketch for, for, this for, the, for the five cent design was titled The Fight Against Ignorance and it uses Nieri's kind of rhetorical style and as you can see it depicts an outdoor village scene with the teacher standing in front of a group of students gesturing to a board whilst the students are looking on intently. Um, but actually, the design goes on. So the first watercolour design, which only survives as a bromide photograph, depicts a, a scene that's much closer to the photograph that, we, that we've just seen, uh, where the teacher's kneeling in front of his students. And, and this actual Colour rough, rough was rejected on the 29th of June 1961 um, because the background buildings were deemed unsatisfactory. And when you compare those with the um, approved watercolour design on, on the right, you can see the structures have been considerably re reworked. The lesson here is a philatelist, and you'll see it again in the series, is don't ignore bromides. Often bromides can have unique features that you don't see in the issued stamps. Um, So moving on to the to the 10 cent, uh, Whiteley's initial pencil sketch for the 10 cent stamp was rejected in early May 1961. Once again, you can see the title Fight Against Poverty. And it's again based on that rhetorical style. And it depicts kind of free individuals working in a field to kind of promote uh, Tanganyika's uh, agricultural technology. And this was rejected in favour of, of a um, a health theme, a kind of a stamp that depicts a, a kind of district nurse, district nursing, which was very popular in, in Tanganyika at the time. And it, 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 the stamp, the 10 cent stamp commemorates uh, or depicts, should I say, an, a female nurse medically examining a child. And it was rejected on the 29th of June 1961. You can see on the colour rough um, the reason why. If you, look at, if you look at her hand, her hand's actually empty. Um, and it's kind of hanging awkwardly in the air uh, and it makes it kind of unclear what she's doing. So Whiteley kind of reworks the design slightly and he incorporates in, in, the, in the kind of colour color rough, moving on from the tentative design, uh, a thermometer. So she's kind of reading the thermometer um, and this was approved uh, and, and they, he produces this finished colour finish design that was the artwork that the stamp is actually based on. 
Uh, the 15 cent uh, design, this one here was obviously rejected in early May 1961. It, it depicts two workers spraying insecticide onto vegetation in an attempt to control the spread of malaria. What they're essentially doing here is, is, um, is spraying DDT, which has a, a quite a huge um, ecological impact on, on, the, on the environment. And, and this was, uh, again, to promote health, but preventative health care was less visual. It had, you know, that's important. It was deemed as, as not, not the impact of it wasn't deemed as, as significant as, as a more kind of active type of health healthcare, and it, it was rejected. Um, and instead they turned to the theme of, of basically coffee, which was a huge export for Tandanika. So the approved design uh, depicts a young woman smiling whilst picking coffee uh, and um, being Tanganyika's main economic activity, the design was based on this official photograph supplied to Victor Whiteley by the government again. Um, what we're looking at here is a bromide of, of, of Victor Whiteley's tentative design for the accepted 15 cent denomination. And you can see what he's essentially done here. He's directly rendered the photograph into a painting. And I like that because what, you're, what, what these stamps are representing are, are realities. Um, they're, they're genuine African men, women and children. And this is a good example of this. Um, this is amended. So you'll notice um, here on, on the bromide, you can see the branches with the coffee beans cutting straight through her body in a way, going right across the, the design. And of course, in the colour finished artwork for the 15 cent design, um, these branches, offending branches, are being cut back and removed, so slightly altered um, for the approved watercolour. A rejected design for the 20 cent stamp um, depicts a young man cutting sisal, which um, was there to commemorate the national sisal in, um, industry, which uh, sisal is a plant that's used in chemical production. I think DDT in memory serves. Uh, and you can see down the bottom here, you know, the, the artist is telling us it's going to be a two colour printing and he's put caption suggestions on, on how it should look. And, and this was rejected on the 25th of May, kind of 1961, um, in favour of uh, a stamp being based upon this official photograph depicting a farmer picking a ripe maize crop, which was another really significant national economic crop for the nation. Um, and if we go from the official photograph to the design, uh, you can see once again what Victor White has done is, is literally just rendered the photograph into, into a painting. Um, uh, and it was initially submitted for the 30 cent denomination. But you could see uh, with the bromide and then moving along what they've done here, essentially they've changed it and, and allocated this to the 20 cent denomination, for the colour finished artwork. Um, Another potential design for the 30 cent stamp depicts a group of workers laying a, a railway line with the outline of a, a locomotive in the background in white to symbolise national rail development. Uh, and I think this was rejected because of the lack of investment. Um, I want you to observe at the minute the white outline of the train with the, with the harder image in the foreground, because this is a, a style that we'll, we'll see again, or this kind of artistic style You'll, you'll see again in the series. Um, it was rejected on the 25th of May 1961 in favour of a design originally proposed for the 20 cent stamp, which depicts the new national flag. Um, and initially, the the colour rough artwork was rejected for the 20 uh, shilling because it was it was deemed to be too large. They didn't like the size of it. So what Victor Whiteley did for the colour finish was he he reworked it into a smaller design. That was approved for the 30 cent denomination. A rejected 50 cent des, uh, design depicts construction workers um, with a crane to kind of commemorate, as we can see from, from the artist's instructions at the bottom, uh, kind of Tanganyika's bridge and railway construction and road development. Uh, once again, rejected because there was, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a sustainable kind of message. It was too costly. Um, 
but what he did what was accepted in, instead was a, a 50 cent stamp commemorating um the tourism industry uh, and this the, the approved design is actually based on this official photograph here depicting two kind of lions reclining under a tree to promote the nation's tourist industry um what i like about these is is um you know one day i'd love to do an exhibition on failed stamp artwork and also a, a an exhibition looking at how photographs and photography impacted stamp design um kind of been working on these for years um the approved design for the one shilling denomination cele celebrates national advances in maternity and child welfare and once again um the actual accepted stamp juxtaposes images from these two official photographs so the first photograph here depicts the frontage of the Siwahaji Hospital in Dar es Salaam, uh, and the second one depicting a nurse named Mary Mazinga presenting a newborn baby to the mother. Now, interestingly, the, the photograph of Mary Mazinga with the mother is no longer in our collection. I, I found this um, picture printed in a book on the uh, official health history of the health service of Tanganyika, where it interviews the nurse, and that's why I know her name, and I know shortly after this, she'd come to England to complete her training. So once again, it's real African men, women, children, um, which is lovely. So it's a real window on, on, on the time. Um, now, when we look at the stamp, uh, moving on. Sorry, my computer's a bit slow. There we go. Uh, when, we, when we look at the, the colour rough artwork and the colour finished artwork, you can see once again what Victor White has done here you've got the white outline of the building with a, a more solid image in the foreground. Um, and, you know, not only did he use it in the rejected design earlier, you can also find this in this kind of style or theme that he, he uses in, in stamps from other parts of the world, such as the Uganda 1962 independence, as you can see this. So, you know, you can see the, 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 personal art, the, the personality of the artist coming out in the stamp design. Now moving on to the 20 shilling denomination, this design is actually inspired by one of the era's speeches, and I'm going to quote um, direct from it. So, so this design is based on a speech that Nieri gave in, in the Parliament in Tanganyika. The people of Tanganyika would like to light a candle and put it on top of Mount Kilimanjaro, which would shine beyond our borders as a ray of hope to all our fellow men, wherever they may be. Now, originally in, in a horizontal format, the design depicts quite literally an arm holding a flaming torch gesturing towards Mount Kilimanjaro. And as you can see, one of the designs incorporates a tree. Um, and then the other one um, is a slight variant of this. You know, it's the opposite direction. The torch has more detail on it and there's some drafts in the background. Um, and and both, were, both were rejected as was the um, horizontal version for the one shilling 30 cent stamp. Um, in the end, what, what they do, the accepted design, they, they change it into a, a vertical stamp. And it's this stamp that's used for the one shilling 30 and the 20 shilling stamp. And you can see at the bottom, there's two dashes of color. So these are kind of background colors. The artist can't, hasn't yet decided what color he wants or what color would be suitable. Um, and for the two shilling stamp, the rejected design commemorates highway development and transportation. These designs really on, on transport and, and infrastructure development didn't really go down well either. And, and once again, you've got the road machine, the, the builders constructing the road in the foreground with the white outline of, of, of a bus. And the second uh, rejected piece of artwork um, to commemorate the highways uh, depicts a, a, a group of Maasai warriors standing behind a convoy or beside a convoy of buses. Um, the actual approved design returns to the tourism industry theme and it was actually based on this photograph and two postcards that were supplied by the Tanganyika government and the approved design is a picture we only have the colour finished artwork for it depicts the the, um, the harbour of Dar es Salaam. So you see the, the urban centre in the background and, and, and the beaches. 
it was very picturesque. So an early watercolour uh, for the five shilling stamp, rejected in early May 1961, depicts a group of individuals, very kind of rough and ready here, standing before the national flag with Mount Kilimanjaro in the background. Um, I can't tell you yet why this was rejected. Um, and likewise, this was rejected. Um, it depicts a man driving a, a tractor plough in a field with the outline of an individual tilling the, the lat soil manually in the background. And here you can see again, it's all it's a free colour printing stamp looking at agricultural advancement, development and mechanisation. Um, it's the theme adopted for the stamp, but you can see the the um, you can see here that that the the stamp itself, you know, it, it, it's much more focusing on the horizontal format with the tractor and the much more mechanized. The, the focus is more on mechanization. Um, now, two designs were submitted by Victor Whiteley for the proposed ten shilling stamp. And the first was rejected in May 1961, and it depicts a, a man standing beside a, a, a Boran ball. I mean, look, it's, it's huge from the looks of it there. And the, in the background, you can see the outlines of the Malia Livestock Research Station in Tanganyika. Um, agricultural education was, was a core part of, of, of Nieri's um, education message. And then the second uh, design also rejected depicts the Williamson diamond mines um, juxtaposed next to a floral shaped uh, diamond brooch on the right. And the, the brooch was actually replaced in the approved design, as you can see on the right, with a pink diamond that was given as a wedding gift by the nation to Queen Elizabeth in, um, at, at the time. It'd be lovely to trace that diamond down. I might do that one day. So, Finally, there, there are there are a couple of points worthy of consideration. Um, Nieri was reluctant to have his portrait adopted on coins and stamps, so that flaming torch motif um, for the one one shilling thirty and the twenty shilling design uh, was adopted as a kind of a proto national symbol. Um, actually, if I go back, so we could look at here, you can see how it's being adopted. And that's on all the stamps. Um, secondly, the, the text, um, the, the text independence or huru and the dates vary on the various designs, which uh, kind of reveals the specific dates of independence were unclear whilst White is working them up. And that feeds in with a lot of the political negotiations going on in the in the background at the time. And when, when all of the designs were approved. A set of bromides were taken uh, to Tanganyika and presented to Julius Nieri for his final approval so that printing operations could begin. And this is a photograph, it's in the Crown Agent's uh, bulletin for the time, and it depicts Nieri with two of his um, government, the Minister of Communications and, and, the, and the Post Office overseeing him as he's signing the approval. Now, the, the, the transition from the design to printing phase of the stamp. Um, production began on the 1st of September 1961 when the Crown agents announced that Harrisons and Sons um, were beginning to prepare the, the stamped printing plates. And colour proofs um, here for the 10 and the 20 cent uh, stamp were, were submitted and approved on the 26th of September. And then two days later, the 30 cent stamp was, uh, the, the proof was approved. Ooh. Sorry, you still there? What's going on with my? Sorry, forgive me. Oh, what have I done? You're fine. They're zooming in for some reason. Let me just come out a second. I'm going to come back. Ah, oh, there we go. That should do it. Uh, the one, two, and ten shilling stamps were all approved on the 29th of September 1961. Uh, so it's you know it's progressing quite quickly it gives you an idea of the length of time this process goes on and the color proof for the 15 cent design was first submitted on the 26th of september 1961 but it was rejected and i'm quoting from the back of this this card 
due to the dirty appearance in general, spots on the face and hands of the coffee picker. So they weren't really pleased with the way that the, the ink had, um, was, was adhering to the, to the face and, and the skin. Um, it was reworked and two proofs were resubmitted on the 11th of October 1961, one being rejected and the other approved. I don't know why um, yet, yeah, I've, I've not spotted the difference. It can take quite a bit of time when they don't tell you to work out what's gone on. Um, the colour proof for the five shilling was also submitted on the 29th of September 1961, but rejected, and um, quoting the back of the card, uh, due to the red working of the sky to be changed to the colour shown on the artwork, i.e. more orange. So they weren't happy with the texture. And it's a really nice example of of kind of the, the the tiny details you know nothing's left to chance they really do break down and analyze how these look um and it was carried out and it was approved following its resubmission on the 11th of october 1961. now the color proof for the 130 uh, submitted on the 29th of september 1961 was clearly rejected because it has the c um for the scent next to the 30 and it was, um, you know, changed and resubmitted and approved on the 11th of October. On the 3rd of October 1961, a proof for the 50 cent was just submitted and approved, so there wasn't any problems there. But when did, you may recall earlier, when, when I was talking about the Victor Whiteley's designs for the 20 shilling stamp, he was unable to decide whether the background colour should be purple or green. Consequently, one proof in each colour was submitted for approval on the 5th of October, where it was decided to yeah. approve mm -hmm. the, the green for the background colour. And the colour proof of the 30 cent initially submitted on the 12th of October 1961 was um, not approved due to the use of yellow BS0002 for gold bands in the flag of Tang Tanganyika. So they're really not happy with these really thin lines of gold and they ask it uh, they asked for it to be changed and it's, it's approved you know a couple of weeks late on the 16th finally um on the 31st of october 1961 uh proof blocks of four overprinted official these were to be used by government on official mail were submitted for approval um so the the five cent proof the 10 cent proof and the 15 cent proof were all submitted and approved on the 31st of september 1961 uh, as were uh, the 20 cent proof the 30 cent proof and the 50 cent proof on the 31st of september uh the the one shilling proof was also approved that day the one that was rejected was the five shilling the official and i think that's because it's, it's not as clear as the others i uh, just it doesn't really stand out well um hence its rejection now now that all the proofs were were approved and you know everything's signed off and it's all agreed stamp production could begin in earnest and stamp printing began between the 8th of November 1961 and the 13th of July 1962. Uh, this image here is actually from, um, it's one of the, it's a few of the printers for the stamps for Harrison's and Sons around the time. Lucky enough, we have uh, some publicity material from that security printer, and that's where this comes from. And these were taken shortly before, uh, you know, kind of mid late 1950s, so near, near contemporary. And these these printers could pr print millions of stamps an hour. I mean, they're, 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 they're you know huge bits of industrial industrial um, technology. So you know the next question is how many stamps were printed. I'm not going to list everything down in detail. Um, they're there for you to have a look at. So um, part of this archive includes the Crown Agents Requisition Books, which list details for. Um, orders for stamps, paper money, other kind of security printing products. And these are the actual details, the initial orders for the all the denominations for the postage and revenue stamps. So there's your denominations in this column, the number of sheets that were ordered for Tanganyika. You'll notice there's number of sheets for London. This is for the Philatelic Bureau, so that they could sell to collectors and the like. Uh, for the Crown Agents Philatelic Bureau. And then details on the number of stamps per sheet. So the, the third column uh, for stuff dispatched, there are discrepancies in the numbers. I can't explain them yet. Um, they either go just over or just under, um, but can't work them out yet. 
And then moving on to the requisition details for the stamped overprinted official. Here we have them again uh, in terms of the numbers and, and quantities dispatched. And then finally, requisition details for related philatelic products. So uh, the order for five shilling stamp books, 21,000 were manufactured, uh, books with four 10 cent stamps, four 15 cent stamps. And then there were also orders for 10 cent stamp reels, 2,000 reels, each containing 1,000 stamps. Uh, what you're looking at here, in essence, is a, a form of mechanically mass reproduced art or mass media. And, you know, in terms of critical theory, that there's real ramifications here about this, this um, reproduction of images. And this is where the semiotics of stamps come in. So at the beginning, I've talked about how these stamps were used as a way to disseminate um, Nier's kind of political um, manifesto, if you will, or his agenda. Um, and that would have been kind of circulating nationally and internationally, and that's demonstrated by these figures here. Um, one of my only critiques with what's written about semiotics and stamps and stamps and national identity, um, to date, it's an incomplete story. Um, it's all very well talking about these images and what they represent, and, and we know that they're used internationally. But there is almost a complete neglect of the postal history. And the postal history and the collecting is the key mechanisms by which these stamps are disseminated. I've been collecting a few myself. Uh, so these are various kind of covers. Um, I've got a few FDCs as well, showing how these stamps can circulate. Um, and there needs to be a, a kind of a combination between kind of traditional philatelic studies the more cultural aspects of the study with the postal history because a message that doesn't get disseminated is a pointless message i'll put down the side in the bibliography uh the collections these are taken from you can see the references i've used a couple of articles that i published in the east african study circle which is what this talk's based on and if anyone's interested in in um, victor whiteley i mean he's He's designed thousands of stamps around the, you know, throughout throughout um, the Commonwealth. Um, I did an article in in kind of stamp and coin mart a few years ago. I have a collection uh, of his stamps. I mean, it's vast, um, and there, there, you know, there needs to be more of that combination. Especially mm -hmm. academics don't understand the nature of what stamps are. A number of people are often, they don't understand the costs that are involved, the technicalities that are involved. They take the stamp at face value. Philately's future is bright if it can engage with academic audiences. I, I truly believe, and I'm, I'm talking about the study of the stamp from the collector at this phase. Um, if we can engage with the academics, with the traditional philately, to teach them to understand how much goes into their design and creation, and then talk about the postal history and that it will really aid their interpretation. So you're combining traditional philately with more cultural-based studies. That would be great. And then I believe that will feed in eventually to collecting. These kids and, and young adults, you know, as they're studying these things in a more busier world, studying and learning to appreciate them, they'll, they'll begin to collect, especially because some of these are cheaper than a bag of chips. Um, I'm going to end it there for now um, because I'm starting to, to waffle, but um, thank you for listening. If you're interested in this kind of work or, you know, want to see what the British Library's philatelic collections are up to more generally, feel free to um, kind of follow us on our social media platforms. And if you've got any inquiries regarding this talk or interest in even coming and using and researching our collections when the building reopens, feel free to either email us on the departmental email or my own personal email. So thank you again. Thank you, Richard. Take in your applause. That was really, really good. I know I have things that I'd like to uh, bend your ear about, but I, I bend your ear all the time. So I'm going to let other people. Casey Joe, I know you had in the chat box, Casey, I don't uh, uh, talked about the torch. You did hit it. Yeah. But, go ahead, hon. Yeah, I was curious about that torch icon that was in every stamp. 
especially the evolution of it from like just a plain torch icon to a hand with a torch icon. And I was wondering if um, uh, Victor Whiteley, who designed the stamps, also designed the icon, or if you knew any more about the development of that icon. To my knowledge, the only, I mean, th this is based, so this study is predominantly based on, on the archive of the Crown Agents Philatelic and Security Printing um, Archive, which is, we've got that at the library. And the artwork, it's a huge collection. There's, there's over, over 60,000 pieces of artwork and photographs like this for various countries. Um, there's no evidence. In an interview he gave for Stanley Gibbons in the 60s, he's told what to produce. He makes that clear in the interview, I, I'm told what to design. So he would have been briefed roughly on what that design was. That being said, there's no evidence in that collection that, that he was presented with an image. So I am under the assumption that that is actually Victor Whiteley's um, initiated that design, but he's been told to produce it, you know, so I think it's his artwork. I think it's his design. I don't think it's a, a model that, that he took. Anyone else? So it was interesting to look at the, why such the detail with the color, like with that gold and the flag? I mean, who mm. made that, who, who was on that to say, oh, that, no, that's, Needs to be tweaked. So, so what you what you find is um, that's often um, decided by a crown agent's official. So the signatures on all of those cards are a crown agent official who it's submitted to, and they look at it and and um, they say yes or no. So it would it would have been it would have been some of the the crown agent's representatives who were commissioned Who's on this project. Agent? The Crown Agents is the, at the beginning, the, the, they're the organisation. So say, for example, I'm in Tanganyika or Kenya or Uganda. I want, I want a set of stamps. Um, the cost of, you know, th these countries didn't have their own in-house security printing industries. So they would approach the Crown Agents. They were middlemen between the Tanganyikan government and the security printers. So they were the ones who would arrange to get your stamps made and shipped out, basically. Uh, and they oversaw all aspects of, of the design and printing process. So it was them who commissioned the artists by tender. It was them who selected the printers, and it was them who would then get the material sent from the United Kingdom to to Tanganyika. Uh, and it's, it's kind of it, it was initially a branch of the of the colonial office in the 19th century. Um, as as the M British Empire grew. And um, all of a sudden, you know, they needed railroads, they needed infrastructure, they needed development. The, the colonial office is kind of struggling under the weight of this, the, this demand for supplies. So they set up the uh, an organisation that that basically supplies that material. It was initially based in Cannon Row um, in Whitehall, but it grew into an all this, this organisation, and it's still active today. They they don't produce stamps anymore, or or banknotes, but that was part of their remit. So if you needed something, they, they would uh, they would get it for you, basically. CJ? Sorry, let me have that a... is kind of an interesting um, to, to hear about that, the Crown Agents as sort of a middleman. Um, since they were the ones commissioning the artwork, um, obviously they were given the pictures, um, but did that have any effect on the response in Tanzania? Um, did the people of the country enjoy these stamps? Do you know about their response to it? Uh, this is one of the hardest things to find in this kind of research response. Um, I think that I think they would have they would have been a matter of national pride. I mean, we certainly know in Ghana um, when when Nukuna um Nkrumah gained independence for Ghana you know stamps were seen as a really important sign of independence and sovereignty and and certainly the amount of of effort you know that that Nyeri and his government put into these you know these designs I mean they, they would have said to the crown agents we want them on this theme this is our material this is the kind of stuff that should inspire the designer you know so they have a say in the production 
to my knowledge, there was no resistance to these designs. Um, what I do find interesting is, I mean, they're obviously pieces of propaganda um, and they don't always, there's some later issues, which I won't go into here, that, that were issued by Tan Tanzania a few years later, um, that were issued on collectivization of, of farmland because they were quite socialist, um, Nia is quite socialist. Um, and that caused a lot of upset in, in Tanzania and Tanganyika um, because a lot of people were dispossessed of their land. No indication of that in the stamp designs promoting them though. Um, and it's strange because again, they're based on realistic photographs, but they don't necessarily reflect the daily reality of the people. Um, they're very difficult to, to kind of gauge, um, you know, how people responded. Is that why you chose this? It seems, you know, it seems pretty complex. Like, I chose it, but yeah, I mean, the, these are actually, I mean, um, the, this paper um, is actually a small part of a, a very large exhibition that I did two years ago. It's still up at the British Library called Stance, Independence and Post-Colonial Future. Um, as I was working on these collections, I realized how rich they were for, for research. And um, I issued it on the last day of the UK Black History Month in 2018. And I did that for various reasons. First of all, I wanted black history should be embedded in our day to day history. Uh, so it's a way of speaking out and saying, you know, that, that it shouldn't just be for a month. It should be embedded. Um, and it was there's over 800 paintings and photographs, not just for Tanganyika. I've got the Kenyan Ugandan independence issues, the Barbados issues. Um, and it, it's a huge range of this kind of material. Um, and it does several things. What I tried to do with the exhibition was show how there's a lot of crossover. So each slide in, in the display, it, took a, it takes an entire case, talks about the history of the stamp design. So it's a history of design and print. It's also a history of independence and visions for post-colonial futures. So, you, you know, it, these are, you know, most academic subjects that look at these tend to be quite Cartesian. They go, right, there's the traditional philately. There's the cultural bits and the historical bits. There's the postal history. That's not how the world works. It's all jumbled up and blurred. And that's what I've been, I'm hoping to get people to think a bit more about and to be a bit more, um, a bit more comprehensive in how they study the material. CJ saying, hear, hear, and same with Rick Howell. Absolutely, I mean, you started your, your presentation by saying how these are uh, seen almost predominantly by us, you know, as face value. And yet I just wrote, you know, that, that's how, and it was like, yeah. And then I just wrote down what you just, what you said, visions for post-colonial independence. I mean, these are really, it's just fascinating to see these, these messages and, and, and how they're trying, and then how the country is, is visioning themselves and, and really will they be able to achieve that. And that was what was cool about that one stamp that was rejected with the machinery because they were they had this actuar actuarial vision like uh, i don't think that machinery is going to be very sustainable but we will look ahead at babies and nursing and medical you know uh, uh, cold, fascinating yeah. because they're taking the they're taking the the, the clay when they're in first independent and they're molding their future and then they put it on a stamp to tell the story and then how uh, you said about the response what is the response so when that guy got that that letter in Germany with the with I mean the stamp, what was you know, it is it's a mumble jumble. Yeah, mess. I think that there uh, there's so much. I mean, one of the things we also tend to neglect is the the juxtaposition. I mean, I always find I love typography on stamps, and by typography I, I don't mean stamps produced using the typography method. I'm on about different types of script on stamps, the way they juxtapose with images, you know, th these things are never left to chance. And part of that start, part of that research, you know, we, we tend to look at the designs mainly because, 
let's face it, a lot of this material isn't out there. Um, one of the most hard, you know, there, there's a real debate amongst philatelists sometimes about, you know, stuff being put in museums and stuff being in the in the collecting market. Um, and as a curator and as a collector, I kind of sit on both sides of the fence. Um, you know, you need stuff to collect to keep it viable, but at the same time, some things need to be institutionalized. What I would urge, and what you do see with philatelic artwork, is often these really important archives are broken up and sold piecemeal by dealers or acquired piecemeal by collectors. I've got my eye on a piece of artwork, um, uh, Nigerian artwork at the minute, for my own collection. And I think what I would urge dealers and collectors to do is, you know, when this stuff comes up, think about it more archivally. Don't just think, oh, I want that, that piece of artwork because I've got that stamp think about the archive and saving it um you know because if, if it isn't in a museum and it gets broken up um the, the friar archive here last year is a good point an example that knowledge gets lost and and our understanding of the production processes get lost um and i think traditional philatelists do need to think more about their designs um jack i'm not including you because of course you look at the penny black and we know full well about wine medals and, and the rest you know but um but by and large, it is something that isn't isn't understood. And you know, <clears throat> looking at the material today, academics, th this is really relevant for academic research. And I think that engagement with academic organizations, with our youth, with other communities as, as embedded with uh, ESPA and, and the amazing work Charlene's doing, this is gonna be key to the future. And it's 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 combining the traditional with the new um and and being interdisciplinary in our scope that and i i would love to throw down the gauntlet that says everybody bring a professor or a teacher or a 4-h leader or a girl scout leader and bring them on so that we can start to Philately relates to absolutely everyone. There's not a person on this planet that can't learn or, or see themselves in a stamp. So I, I like what Richard said. You know. I'd, I'd like to make a comment that uh, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate your uh, presentation, Richard. It's always a pleasure when you're presenting because you open our eyes to all kinds of things. And, Thank uh, you. I also wanted to comment uh, uh, Victor Whiteley must have been quite a, a persistent guy to, to put up with all the rejections and frustrations and and keep at the work, keep at the job, you know, and just keep on designing stamps. And uh, I guess he must have been quite a prolific designer. He was. You often find as well that designers don't just work on stamps. I mean, they work across a range of mediums and formats. Uh, a good example, today I just submitted a, a, an article to Heidi looking at um, book printers, Chinese uh, Western uh, style book printers in China during the, the um, treaty port period, because many of these book publishers were also designing stamps and banknotes for China during that period, and also again during the, the Republican period. Um, you know, Victor Whiteley was designing um, kind of technical drawings for washing machine instructions, food packaging. David Gentleman was designing coins and heritage artwork. Um, you know, the, our, our, our material fits so beautifully into kind of a whole range of, of fields, uh, print culture, art history, um, mass media type studies, semiotics. Um, if you if you look at postal history network theory, um, you know, in terms of letters, um, you know, a lot of these modern academic interests about networks, it's all there in the postal history and the philately. And the key is to kind of look at our material in that way and shape through. And I mean, in, in terms of kind of stamps, you know, we've got to remember that stamps were, were inherently created to... Um, they were initially used in Europe to build up the revenue and communication infrastructures of what are known as fiscal military states. Uh, so, you know, core parts of the of the nation state development. We've got to remember that they were also tools of colonial control. They were also foreign technologies that were introduced overseas. I mean, in the case of China, again, 
you know, um, it's the it's the opium wars that leads to the introduction of stamps into China, albeit 20 years later. But the you know, there's also a very modern message there uh, that you know we need to kind of think about and, and feed into. But at the same time, we can't just look at them in that negative light um, because they become appropriated by these post-colonial states and then they're used by their new ruling elites um and kind of likewise you can you can find you know evidence of iconoclasm on stamps uh you know the definitive stamps for um iran after the revolution where they literally overprint to blot out the head of the shah um, you know, and again, this kind of stuff feeds into the modern scenes we're witnessing uh, in the US with the Confederate statues. And only yesterday in, in Bristol, when the uh, statue of a notorious slave trader was was thrown into the to the river. So, I mean, you know, our, our materials current is relevant. It's exciting, dynamic and it's interdisciplinary. And, you know, let's let's um, let's start getting getting into it and, and and embracing and getting more and more people embracing our material yeah i just wrote that with big stars all over interdisciplinary that that is that's it that's it richard can you say something more about the networking the postal uh, yeah um the so postal network. I mean, basically, letters, letters by networking. I mean, most pe most academics. It's a heavily used word. I look at it more in a mathematical sense. So, one of my research interests is trying to apply graph theory, so mathematical um, network mapping of, of of letters. And you know, most modern most letters tend to enable us to do that. So you'll have what's known as a node, and that would be, for example, the sender and a recipient of a mail. And then you can map that using postal history beautifully using rates and routes. Did it come by ship? Did it come by train? Uh, you can then map that over time and where, how those networks grow, how they expand by the, the amount of material that survives. I mean, it'll, it'll always be an incomplete picture. And, and you could literally use postal history with archival material because archives in, in the, around the world, they're predominantly made of letters. So, I mean, not just philatelic archives, mainstream local archive government archives national archives they have amazing postal history treasures hidden in them with this kind of information that could be untapped and paul the postal communication revolution into the modern ict based revolution because at the minute the two are like trains in the night they're beside each other but they never they rarely cross over and there's, there's no reason why that should be the case um one example I did was last year, I published an article on early um, or English mercantile correspondence from 17th century Japan. Of course, anyone who reads the postal history of Japan, foreign, mercant foreign postal history begins 19th century, second half of the 19th century. So why are there a group of letters from three, you know, a couple of hundred years <laughs> earlier? They're in the archive, and this is what postal historians need to do you know look at our collections learn from our collections but incorporate archival material to support that so we get a fuller picture um it's why i love the subject it's there's so many areas that we're so underexploited still in academia and likewise there's so much new stuff out there i mean the best career decision of my life six years ago was to transfer from the india office records to the philatelic collections i've not looked back i've not looked back Interesting. Thank you. Are you going to be publishing more articles? Yeah, I've got about 60 to my name, so I've got plenty on the <laughs> way. Um, at the minute, I'm just doing a piece on uh, philatelic, uh, philatelic and postal history treasures from the British Library's music manuscript collection. So I've got Mozart's marriage certificate with revenue stamp paper. I've got letters from Hayden with postal markings. I'm doing a piece on the post office and how it facilitated international research in the 17th to 19th century. Um, I'm doing some other pieces as well on, on um, kind of more traditional based uh, phila uh, philatelic studies as well. Um, I'm very interested in the Sindhawk and, and some of the early India issues. And I'm also very interested in chi uh, Chinese stamps. I'm working up a book at the minute on 
the first female stamp designers of China, and it feeds into my wider research on women in stamp production, um, amongst other things, but, but uh, no shortage of ideas. <laughs> Great, thank you. You're welcome. Well, everyone, we our hours is up and it absolutely flew by. Thank you so much, Dr. Morrill, for joining us from London. Again, Dr. Richard Morrill from the British Public Library. He is also an APS member. That was just fascinating. And um, you, Gary, you can find Richard at the various uh, uh, addresses you see, but you can also check out his YouTube channel. Um, where he's got a great series called Philately Dad. And it's a, it's a wonderful series for getting kids engaged with, uh, with stamp collecting. Um, they're all bite-sized and a lot of fun, and it was a family hoot nanny to get that together. Um, CJ had mentioned about the, the, the article in the latest AP about the atomic bomb. So that's in the table of contents. And I really thought it was great because I can show Jim Gates, who is on the call, he is the a librarian at the uh, National uh, Baseball Hall of Fame, and he's in our art in our AP as well. Remember, APS AP members, you or the APS members, you get the American Philatelist and talk about an interdisciplinary journal. You can't get better. There's there's not nary a place that I don't want to leave this. Be it the you know the hairdresser. The, there we go the golf club, wherever, the bus station, there we go. I think we're gonna have to do a, a picture like that. But truly, the, the, you know, I think that Dr. Morrill really nailed it on the head is how interdisciplinary it is and how much room for growth. And we're all very welcoming people. So I do, I do, I would like to ask people start to invite their friends and, and shout out and not just be in, a, in an echo chamber, but let, let's get people excited. Uh, the next AP stamp or APS stamp chat is on Monday. We are, and it's at 11 a.m. because we've got, well, like Dr. Morrow from Europe and, and Jack Jang. Uh, they're coming to us. Sebastian Del Camp will be with us of uh, Del Camp, what, collecting? Is that it? Every, I mean, I'm like, he's like a really, it's a, it's a big organization. So Sebastian Del Camp will be with us at 11 a.m. on Monday. And then Mr. Patrick Marsalis will be with us on Tuesday at 9 a.m. So we have two early morning or relatively early morning stamp chats next Monday and Tuesday. Be sure to check out stamps.org to keep up with stamp chat. This stamp chat, like all the others, will be up on the YouTube channel, the APS YouTube channel. So feel free to watch again and share, 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 like, share, subscribe. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you next Monday. Thanks again, Richard. And thanks for everybody for participating. Really appreciate it. Good to see everybody on the call. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.